Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollock, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Leah Ryan, the festival director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. I'm standing in a beautiful garden at a private home in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a city known for weathering storms. When Hurricane Hugo hit in 1989, water was waist high throughout much of the city. And as this has been a summer in which named storms have outnumbered letters in the alphabet, this seems like a perfect place to introduce this session. Jenny Offel's novel, Weather, tackles big picture issues as seen through the lens of a middle-aged woman negotiating family, climate change, and addiction. Jenny is also the author of Department of Speculation and Last Things. She's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, and is writer in residence at Vassar College. Gia Tolentino's book, Trick Mirror, is bold and playful, a collection of essays satirizing modern culture. A staff writer at The New Yorker, she graduated from the University of Virginia and received an MFA from the University of Michigan. She's written for The Hairpin, Jezebel, Pitchfork, and The New York Times Magazine. Together, these two New Yorkers make a dynamic team of millennial writers making waves throughout their industry. They dissect the crises and intricacies of our times and they do it with insight and a great sense of humor. I'm so proud to introduce Jenny Offill and Gia Tolentino. Okay, I think we are broadcasting. Hello, everyone who we can't see. This never gets less strange. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad we're all here this morning. And I'm so glad to be here speaking with Jenny Offal, the one of the most brilliant writers working today. Um, her writing intertwines the existential and the everyday like no one else. And I've um, yeah, it just speaks to a register of our brains that few of us are honest enough to access that clearly. And I've been really grateful for it for a long time. And as I was just saying to Jenny, I've been thinking about your work a lot lately because I just had a baby. And I, in particular, I think about that line from Department of Speculation, which I underlined the first time, but it really hits now when it's the, the narrator is thinking about the prisoner in Alcatraz who spends all night dropping a button on the floor and picking it up again. The narrator thinks, I don't have a button, but in all other respects, my life is the same. So that, I think about that line at least 12 times a day. So um, <laughs> thank you for taking the time to hang out and talk today. Thanks for having me. Um, so, and also thank you to the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival based out of South Carolina. Um, we are gonna talk 
till about noon, but the last 10, 15 minutes will take y'all's questions. If anybody has them, I think you can submit them on Crowdcast or in the chat here on Zoom. Um, and so, you know, before we get into writing, we've all had a week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I sort of was thinking before, I was like, oh, by the time we have this conversation, we will be in this, it'll be post-election. But I'm beginning to feel like we're not really gonna have a post-election feeling. Like there's not, there's not gonna be a, a neat button on this last four years on this election. It's, it's, it's gonna be this weird sort of purgatorial limbo. Um, and so, I mean, how have you spent the week? How, how, how's your brain been this week? Um, I have spent the week uh, either fielding crazy texts and calls from freaked out friends who are worried about things or um, just looking again and again as if somehow if I'm a correct researcher, I will discover <laughs> who has been elected president even though no one else has called it. Um, yeah, it's been very distracting. I've, um, I, I think you're right that it's just, it, it's funny because I remember reading that this was gonna be an election week. I remember reading that there was gonna be a red mirage first and then a, right. <laughs> none of it mattered because emotionally some part of me just thought that maybe that there would be this repudiation and he would win. Um, and so now I think maybe if there's gonna be a celebration, it will be um, if Biden becomes president and he's on the day he's actually inaugurated. <laughs> I feel like everything up till then is um, potentially chaos. Right. And uh, yeah, I, it's right. In my head, I was like, okay, um, election night, it's going to look like Trump's winning and then the mail-ins will come in and then it'll be litigated in court till January and you just have to make peace with that. But something deep inside me was hungering for closure that yeah. only emerged like in the last couple of days. <laughs> and, and, you're, and weather ends with on like weather ends this week, right? Yeah. Effectively. Um, well, I'd never done that before in a novel. Um, so at, towards the end of, of, of the book, um, the main character, Lizzie, who's a librarian, um, she goes and she's, she's with the other people voting and it's for this election. Um, and she doesn't know the result yet. And, um, and then she's home with her husband and she's listening to sounds outside and they're debating what they are. Uh -huh. She thinks they're gunshots. He thinks there's something else. And that would basically be right now. <laughs> so it's funny to have uh, like finally arrived at um, of that moment because it was very interesting to try to imagine at the time I wrote it, you know, two more years down the road, what, what would things look like? What did, as you were imagining it, what did you like, so the emotional tenor you were imagining was just deep ambiguity, right? I mean, was- Right, I mean, I, uh, on top of, you know, over the years ruining a couple dinner parties with my climate crisis. Uh, I'll talk about that for sure, I've been that person. Um, I was also an early proponent of, um, this is, this could go very much towards, um, descent into fascism, like they're removing the guardrails. So I've been saying that and and sort of getting a lot of, that's very alarmist, um, I you know, a response for a long time. But I think it's partly because I'm not on Twitter as a, uh, I don't tweet myself, but I have like most people have like little tiny weird parts of Twitter that they go onto. So I yeah. hang around and lurk a lot on authoritarian scholar Twitter, <laughs> uh, <laughs> authoritarian right. scholar, it's like, Timothy D. Snyder, Ruth yeah. Ben, yeah, all these people. And they're extremely kind of calm, uh, measured people, but they have been saying like, don't, don't disregard the possibility that, um, that, that this will all fall apart. So mm -hmm. I, when I was writing, I wanted to imagine a time where, uh, a, a few more of what we think of as the norms or the guardrails to democracy had fallen off. Like I certainly, like the post office stuff, for example, was a good example of that. Right. It's funny too. I mean, you're so, it's actually like last night I was having a, like I heard owls hooting, but suddenly they sounded like laughing apes. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, you need, like something is off in your brain. You know, it's like, you, yeah. this is a, uh, something else coming out. I was going to ask you actually what your relationship was like to the internet because you know you are like truly the best writer alive on just the everyday sort of dread that you get when you take in 
the news, reality, whatever, anything. And I, yeah. What's your relationship to the internet? And yeah. Well, I mean, I, um, like I said, I'm a total lurker on, on all sorts of <laughs> social media. The reason I don't do it myself is I, I did it for like a very short period many years ago. And I, I felt like instantly kind of addicted to it. And yeah. like, uh, it was shaping my, I, I felt like I was watching in real time, my brain. Oh yeah. And um, Twitter was, you know, sort of would have been my drug of choice. And you can see how, since I write these smallish little things, right. um, it was really pleasing to right. put something out there and have like instant gratification of whether it was funny or someone liked it instead of taking seven years. <laughs> <laughs> for that same little small thing. But then one day I was on a walk and I just found myself like thinking about something and then twisting it to see how it would fit. Right. And I came home and I said to my husband, I think I should delete Twitter. Yeah. He said, okay, do it right now. And I was like, oh, okay. But it was one of those like weird marital dares where I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I did it. And and I often think that it was, it, for me, it was one of the better um decisions I ever made because I just um I am such a slow writer and I one of the ways that the little fragments that I put in my book one of the ways that I decide if they're good enough if they fit in and they're not random is by allowing them to sit for a long time right. so it's, it's the, the instantaneous quality of of social media doesn't work well with my writing style right and it also is I mean, I think it's like, I, I think of it as sort of a, a useless anxiety generator rather than a productive anxiety generator. You know, it's, it's kind of a superficial one rather than the deep, true, like real, you know, bad feelings that I try to sit with that, you know, the endless refreshing. I mean, I, I recently got off of Twitter mm -hmm. in July, um, but I got back on it this week because I was like, only me by refreshing quicker will find Pennsylvania, you know? Yeah, me too. I, that's, what I've, that's what I've been doing. It's like, oh, yeah. I'll be the first to know. Despite right. all this. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh yeah, this does. I mean, I, in a way it was disappointing because I was sort of expecting to get off and like, you know, instantly have my brain start working again because it had been very bad throughout the pandemic and that didn't happen, but it has been nice to be off of it. And I, I'm going to maybe try to stay off of it. Um, so yeah. So these fragments that make it into your book, I was, you know, I was rereading that Pearl, Pearl Seagull's beautiful um, profile of you. And, you know, she described it as a process of, you know, you gather these things and there's this concept that's in both weather and department speculation of sort of a rate and inherent radiance to things that sometimes dwindles over time, sometimes remains. And she was describing that, you know, exactly what you were just saying, these little facts or scenes or ideas, and, you know, they have to stay radiant <coughs> over seven years. And if they do, they make it into the book. And, and so, and I, and I was wondering, so, you know, in particular, there are lots of facts about the natural world, about sort of like space and exploration and deep time that become metaphors for your narrator's existence in ways that are sometimes profound, sometimes very absurd, sometimes both. Um, and I think, and I, like my one that I've been thinking about recently, like I often think about, you know, some plants will, when they are in, when they're stressed out, they will choose one leaf to sacrifice um, and, and then, and they'll conserve the water for all the other leaves. And that one leaf will turn yellow and fall off this perfectly green <laughs> plant. And I've been thinking about that as it applies to my life in ways that sometimes I'm like, wow, great metaphor. And, and others I'm like, yeah, you're a fucking idiot. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are any, you know, not to ask you to give away other fragments that might be in future books, but are there any of these facts that are at the top of your mind kind of metaphorically lately? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. that's a great one. I, 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 I love that one. Um, well, I think that, I think a lot right now about um, just some of the facts I came across in disaster psychology. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I guess I just um, continued to be surprised by when I would read about it was how much our brains can just make something seem normal no matter what it is. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm always thinking about uh, how they did all these studies on people in plane crashes and that, that half the people won't even get up uh -huh. sit there. Like I've landed, but I'm not allowed to get off the plane yet because no one's telling me and there'd be like flames. And, and so one of the reasons that they say so many times 
that you have to, um, you know, remember, and they say don't take anything, is um, is because people's brains are like, when I leave an airplane, I take my things. And so flames can be all around them, but our brain still looks for the template. And I think in terms of like political coverage of this very, um, you know, norm breaking president, we keep seeing that. We keep seeing a sort of, um, oh, well, surprising. I mean, I, I, I was saying the other day to someone, I don't think that the New York Times constantly says baseless conspiracy theory. I don't feel like everyone in the country, like that word resonates right. for them the way it does for journalists, where they're like, I'm like, just say false. Yeah, yeah. Not true, made up. Right. <laughs> you know, so I do feel like I think about that. And then in, in terms of like, um, I think sometimes a lot about being in the country versus like living in the city for so many years. One of the little facts, I guess, I never put in a book was um, that they they think when you're in nature, your eye, your brain calms down because what you're looking at are soft fascinations. It's like you're looking at a tree or a bird or whatever, and you get to take it in, but you don't have to interpret it in, in a lot of detail. You're not like Think, I mean, maybe if it's like a bear <laughs> or something, but if it's if it's something that is just in a sort of low key everyday uh, countryside thing, um, so your brain gets to to rest a little bit. Whereas when you're somewhere, and I'm a real city person, when you're in a city and you're, it's just natural for you to be calculating and calibrating the emotional expressions of everyone around yeah. you and seeing what you're picking up on. And so I was like, oh, that's why it feels different here to go for a walk after being so. Um, filled with dread. It's like soft fascination. <laughs> oh my God, what a good phrase too. Jesus. I'm gonna, <laughs> sounds like an 80s synth band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds like a like a clothing store I would like to open. <laughs> like, um, how did, well, how long ago did you move from the city to upstate New York where we both are this morning? This, like, yeah, um, it has been a while now. I think yeah. um, it's been about eight years. And did, did you find that that way of noticing the, the way, like if the ambient way of noticing was changing when you were just walking around outside your house. Yeah, did you find that it changed your, your like interpretive process in writing at all? Or like how, generally did the, yeah, how did the, the well, move from this was, density of New York to the... Yeah, I mean, I moved up here after weather. So, I mean, after department, yeah. um, as if I was following my own yeah. <laughs> character, but, um, but, I um, I think it did have something to do with writing of this novel because I think one of the questions I guess I was thinking about as I was writing this novel is, is you know, at this point in my life, um, there's so much caretaking, um, whether it's with my own daughter or, you know, my parents are older and they're nearby or my students. Um, and I was just kind of thinking um, about how when, when I started to look more into questions about, I don't know, these bigger systemic things, whether it's climate crisis or just huge forms of inequity or racism, um, that the question that is sort of behind all of it is like, oh, okay, I guess I need to worry about the whole world too. Right. And I wanted to write about a character who was actually quite empathetic, if anything, kind of pathologically empathetic, that she took in everything her patrons at the library said, that she looked after her brother, that she worried about the guy on the street who didn't have a place to live. Um, but then when it comes to thinking about the rest of the world and even about the non-human creatures, which is part of what you think about when you really dive into environmental things, um, I wanted to write about how overwhelming that is at first. Yeah. and. And then slowly in the book, have it, it be, she, she begins to like notice things with less effort as it goes in, you know, to, to the, the non-human things as it gets farther in. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about caring and uh, caregiving recently as well. And I, I mean, a lot, both department and whether about sort of this like vexed, impossible, necessary nature of caring and how kind of complicated it is to put care and practice in the real world, right? Where it's like, 
we need to care about as many people as possible, but it's also impossible to care about as many people as possible. And, you know, there are all these questions, like, can we love the world the way we love the people close to us? Or like, can we even sufficiently love the people close to us the way we want to? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, and then there's the, there's the other poll that is also through both of those books is like the, the, like, there's this necessity of attachment, the impossibility of attachment, and then the also the this necessity of non-attachment at the same time at, at the sort of Buddhist sort of like peace with our ephemerality and our evanescence. Um, and I guess I was wanting to ask you like how you think about the relationship between like, you know, if we love, if we care for one person, we have to care for Mm -hmm. as many people as possible, right? We are so interconnected. We're in me enmeshment is the word that recurs in weather. And that's something that the whole pandemic has really like hammered home at every, yeah. just the incredible enmeshment of all of us. Um, but then there's a, there's a necessity of recognizing that there's a necessity of sort of practicing or for your narratives, at least for practicing some form of non-attachment of sort of allowing, you know, making peace with, you know, the vanishing nature of life on earth. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about that. I mean, you know, it's, it's this endless subject, but these two poles are so, um, they're the poles that we're all kind of living between now. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, I, you know, I used the word, I think earlier of, of being porous. And I do feel sometimes that there's this sense that like um, everything gets through and that that may be a good way to be, a sensitive person and maybe helps to be a, a writer, but it's very hard in terms of everyday life. If if every um, every person you encounter that has um, sadness in their eyes, you know, feels like like you might have to do something to help them or whatever. I mean, I, I um, and so this idea about enmeshment that I was writing about, which also can be used in an ecological sense of like how we're all intertwined. Um, I feel like one of the things that happened with the pandemic is that it it took all these words which are kind of feel fuzzy like interconnectedness and it gave them this almost like sinister power yeah. because suddenly if you went to the grocery store um, and you pulled a can off the shelf I mean I know I thought about the person who put the can there, about the person right. who packed the can, about the person that I had to, you know, check out from, and how were they feeling? And I could see sometimes how scared they looked. Um, and, and so I feel like uh, a lot of my own ideas about um, kind of your responsibility to others. Um, I think it comes from like I was raised. Um, my parents were quite Christian when I was younger. Um, and so, and they were of the, of the type of Christian who were, um, really focused on like that we have to give back to the community. So I always kind of grew up with that, like, but there, there, but for the grace of God, go I, um, uh -huh. thing. And that if you do think that way, then you really should have humility about whatever, um, happens to you in your life. If, if good things happen to you, or if you have success, um, the sense that we often have in America that it's deserved and this other person didn't deserve it. And that's why they're in, um, in the straits they're in, you know, I was really trying to fight against that in, in the book. Um, and that's just something I think about a lot. But as you say, it's sort of impossible to write. It's like the, like here again, it's, the, you know, we need to do that. I mean, I, I'm also like, that is like the pulse that goes through my, had every second and you're right the pandemic made it so concrete it sort of made the labor theory of value like extremely <laughs> you know on its surface um epidemiologically but um you know i think it's in weather where the narrator kind of i guess there's quotes a the buddhist idea that you know like it's, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the phrasing wrong, but it's like as if each stranger is your mother or your brother. What's, what is it? This, yeah, this, it's just the, the idea that that um, that we've all been everyone else in other lives. So right. anyone that you encounter might have been in another life, your mother or your sister or your brother, 
or your enemy or your, right. or your love. Yeah. Right. And it's such a, I mean, like that idea is resonant in so many, you know, it's like the original position. Like, it's like, you know, like that is how we should imagine the world, but it is crushing to do, to actually do so. Right. Like it's, you know, if you really, if you go around the world that totally porously, you know, there is, it is also extremely hard to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think that's what, like I found so crushing and so amazing about that book. It's like, that is how I want to live. And it also, when you try you, um, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of empathy, I just saw in our chat room, um, one of the things I'm excited about if Biden um, comes president <gasps> is his empathy and it just got called on CNN. <laughs> So Holy um, shit. I'm, that's very exciting. Wow. wow. Here we were talking about this like purgatory till January and at least they <laughs> called it. <Yeah>. Oh. <laughs> so um, that's exciting. I mean, I, I actually do think about that because, you know, Biden was not my first. Um, oh, yeah. No. Not the person I would have picked to be the, the nominee. But I did feel like it was so interesting to watch someone who did seem genuinely to have empathy, perhaps because he suffered so much. In yeah. his own and, you know, right now when we're going through this crisis and so many people have died um, and we, we don't mourn as a country at all. We don't, I mean, I was in New York during 9-11 and there was like this constant uh, sense of community mourning. You know, we would all go and look at the pictures of the people that were still up and, I, you know, there was like vigils and, and this tragedy has been, so much more diffuse and of course so politicized um right. that i feel like this interconnectedness um idea you know has kind of been blown to bits since when i was first uh you know thinking of it for this book but i also in in, in whether i really wanted i wanted to take because i myself am sort of uh at least on the surface um kind of bored by environmental things so i wanted to take um, someone that was not already um, an activist, was not already enmeshed in that world and show what it was like to kind of move from what I think of as like a soft form of denial when of course you know that it's happening but you don't look at it directly and you also don't let it affect you emotionally. And during the course of the book, Lizzie becomes less and less able to just think of it intellectually. I mean, it starts to hit her it starts um, to hit her so hard that she starts looking up prepper tips about how yeah. to make a candle out of a tuna can, which is something like definitely in the, you know, in the dark of night, like with my like infant, all I, like I've had, you know, I'm like, I don't give a shit if she goes to college. I just want her to go to Unabomber school and learn how to learn rough skills and learn how to skin an animal. You exactly. know? Yeah. I'm just like marry a Canadian or, or, or someone yeah. from Scandinavia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. God, I'm still, I'm like, I feel high, like knowing that's <laughs> called it. I know. That's so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, we were talking about the sort of soft denial and then you're starting to feel the loss that you've repressed. I mean, this is like the theme of the entire year and like possibly this whole era, like, you know, that you're, that was also what we were just talking about with coronavirus. Like it's, there is, um, and I think it, and I do think it's partly because of our, many of our lived environments. Like I, for me, I found it much harder to process reality in general when I'm in one room inside most of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to like, it's harder to understand the collective when you don't. And even like me being mostly out of New York city for the pandemic, I think has, you know, when you're there, you, you, you know, New York kind of it cognitively pounds it into you that you right. live in. And that's why everyone is so good at mask wearing because, yeah. but it's like, I, I was just talking to friends last night that it'll be like, it's amazing how new it will feel to have climate, you know, like numbers on global warming, not be suppressed and wiped from the internet yeah. and have like deaths actually properly, you know, maybe a national mask mandate, like things that I was like, it will be in pot, like in my mind, I had thrown out the idea that our federal, like public health policy could save people's lives effectively. Yeah. And now it's like, well, shit, like. <laughs> it could happen now. It could happen. <laughs> yeah, and I was a little disappointed. I mean, I understand it. It's just what the left does, but you know, they immediately were just talking about how hard it was gonna be to govern and how we would da 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 da, -da because of the Senate. And I was like, well, I don't know. We might join the Paris Agreement again. Right. And the and World we might get the Health Senate. Organization. <laughs> you know, we that's still, good. We could still get the Senate. 
Um, but yeah, right. I mean, it's like little things like, you know, just like scientists won't have to erase their like, climate change data. Like, um, uh, well, okay, since we're talking about the pandemic, I was another thing from Department of Speculation that hit differently upon this recent reread. So I also have like a, or I don't know if this is you or your narrator, but I, I have like a serious thing about Antarctic expe uh, expeditions. <laughs> I, I love them. And I, I have this like almost intense like cathexis towards Antarctica like I I would love to just go there for a year and go nuts like it I just want that spare insanity of it um but uh Department of Speculation there's a quote from an explorer named Frederick Cook from an expedition in 19 1898 from Antarctica and he writes we are as tired of each other's company as we are of the cold monotony of the black night and the unpalatable sameness of our food physically mentally and perhaps morally then we are depressed and from my past experience I know that this depression will increase <laughs> obviously I was like me me in month five of pandemic you know <laughs> it's is, it is like a pandemic isn't it well the only project I've done since weather was I made uh, a weirdo experimental movie Movie with my filmmaker friend about scurvy and about people being um, really wintered over in Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. Tell me more about this. It's not done yet. I'll okay. send <laughs> But yeah, I read nothing but that uh, last winter. Doesn't that weather start with a scurvy scurvy fact? Is there a scurvy fact in weather? I think the scurvy fact in weather, or maybe yeah, it's it's the it's the scurvy was understood initially as not a problem of vitamin deficiency, but as a disease of desire, right? Oh, no, I think I was just talking about that in some interview because I was like, oh. yeah, like oh, the yeah, scurvy yeah. stuff hasn't made it into anywhere yet. But oh, yeah, yeah it was the Times profile, right. And that was yeah. like, and that it, that it sort of has an idea that like, when you'd been um, deprived that much that once you came close to land that the smell of a blossom, you know, could kill you or the taste of an orange would be so voluptuous that you might drop dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I just feel like, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm interested in these ideas of, you know, as much as I spent all this time thinking about environmental stuff when I was writing weather, it was only during the pandemic, it, the, you know, the worst of it was kind of hard to get groceries. I had an onion and I was chopping it and I was like, I guess I should save this little weird part of it. Like my grandmother who grew up during the depression would you know, found it in your windowsill. Yeah, it was like for the first time, yeah. I, I sort of like concentrated that feeling onto an object versus something, you know, sort of, um, you know, now I'm back to, to wasting things. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, has the pandemic, how, how has the pandemic changed your writing life, let's say? Um, it has obliterated it. <laughs> That's how it's changed it. Um, just because I'm, I'm really never alone. And, oh yeah. Um, and I like to be alone to write. Um, so yeah. Um, question time. Question time. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that's saying for, um, the, uh, audience. I don't know. Wait, sorry. Just listen. Oh, okay. I'm not going to look at the chat. We'll, we'll do questions in like 10 minutes. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. So I just haven't, I haven't been able for a couple reasons. Um, one, I just tend to need like a little time away to, to really get a head of steam on when I'm writing. Yeah. So like you were saying that you wrote a lot of your book at Airbnbs, you know, I often do it when I'm traveling or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that it's very, um, this is a very minor problem of dealing with the pandemic, but it's very strange as a writer to try to write about something that everyone else is also experiencing. Right. You know, because you're sort of like, oh, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to find your little corner of it, I guess. Well, and it also, I mean, I think a couple of outlets, like maybe New York Review of Books or something got nailed when they were, you know, having writers do sort of pandemic diaries. And I, and I kept one because starting like, I got, yeah, starting last year, I just have been trying to keep a notebook for no reason, like a notebook full of totally useless thoughts that will never go anywhere, literally recording the weather. And, um, right. And I, and, but I think like I, I got self conscious of, you know, my, the reality of any writer that is publishing their thoughts during the pandemic, like we, our lives are probably, you the know, thing. yeah. And it's just this narrow band of existence, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like I'm in my, working at home in my comfortable house and I, you know and like it's yeah, just yeah. incredibly embarrassing sameness of yeah I know the part where it was like it's from Brooklyn it's from France it's from right. everyone's like 
I miss going to get my coffee down the street. Right. Now I make it at home. <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. It's like I make a lovely dinner with my partner and have my in my nice warm house, you know. Like yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I feel like it would have been better to do a pandemic photo essay. Yeah. Because the part where like, I don't know if these people are really all living such like elegant, gracious lives, but like our bathroom looks like it's in a frat house. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and given and any time that dinner has to be made, it's like kind of a sad standoff of like, all right, you know, like this many months in. Um, oh, I know. I, I guess I'm I gonna make nachos. You know, it's just like so. I feel like it would. I would like to see pictures of people's houses more than I would like to hear them uh, opine. On yeah. Them. Yeah. I remember, like, I was like, oh, good. I'm gonna because I'd been think. I was like, okay, I'm gonna like have my hands more on my life, which is something that I've like been trying to do. And I was like, okay, I'm going to really like take my time. And and then two months into the pandemic, I was so like, all of a sudden I was like, wait, I miss this accelerated capitalism where instead of me spending 45 minutes roasting these vegetables, I just yeah. walk into a goddamn dig in. <laughs> and like, you know, I was having the reverse. I was like, give me the acceleration again. No, me too. I was like, oh, it was fun to critique when I can still go and get it. And now right. I'm just all about prepared food. <laughs> Yeah. Um, this is just a general question that I, um, have been wondering just in terms of, you know, the kind of mundane anxieties that bump around in our minds, does writing clear them for you? Does writing like zero them out for you? Or does it clarify them in a way that makes them more present? Like how there's a way in which, you know, if I, if I write about whatever is swirling in my head, um, yeah. it, it the process of trying to write about it um, with, you know, particularity and with a kind of um, examination of like, okay, what is what about this is is potentially interesting, and what about this is just kind of a received idea that I might have already had before I started thinking about it. Um, I do feel like the rigor of like trying to go through that process is very much uh, lessens the anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of is, um, and it's also the reason I put so many um, like facts that are interesting to me in books is because I don't actually remember things unless I write them down and like try to put them in my own words. So like if I'm something like, I didn't want to forget, you know, that, that antelopes have 10 X vision and can see the rings of Saturn. So I was like, okay, I, I'm going to find a place for this. Um, yeah, so for me, um, I don't find writing very easy, <clears throat> but um, but I do find it to be, well, I always sort of joke that like anyone who's a writer, you can tell because when they have a vacation, it's like a vacation to go write. They're like, well, school's ended. I just turned in all the papers and it looks like I can go away for two days, right. and, like write constantly for 48 hours. Right. You know? So um, so that's what I'm craving. Uh, that's what I'm missing. Um, yeah, I, I think that's part of why my brain isn't, uh, I, I find it hard to kind of, I don't feel like I'm getting lost in anything. Like the way that when I'm writing, I feel very much like I'm in, like time passes very quickly. I may just come away from the day with one sentence, but the time went really quickly while I- Right, right, right. That sense of total absorption. I have also found it to be difficult in the pandemic. It's hard to like reach that sort of intense flow when yeah. so much feels like stasis. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's it's interesting you talking about anxiety like this. It's sort of the same sort of distillation process. You, you, you know, if you write it down, you are, you're distilling it down to the parts that- like whatever radiant parts of that anxiety, like whatever mm -hmm. actually matters, whatever, um, and w separating the part that is kind of received and repeated from the part mm -hmm. that is still like, you know, giving off some some energy or some like mm -hmm. real actual terror or whatever. Um, and I wanted, you know, so since Department of Speculation, what year was that published? Uh, 2014. 2014. And, and like, I mean, that might be the book that I have repurchased more than any time. Because anytime I've lent it out to somebody, they just steal it. And which I, it's, I'm, I love that. And, and so I, but it's been interesting in the last six years, let's say, and I guess, you know, around when everyone started reading Maggie Nelson, the, the sort of fragment, the, you know, the lyric essay or the, the fragmented form has become, you know, with that book becoming so popular um, and, you know, other, I was, you know, other writers who use that form, 
it's become a much imitated thing. Yeah. And, and I was wondering, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you think are the hallmarks of when it's done badly and when it's done right? Like, what are the sort of internal rules governing this, this, mm -hmm. this structure for you? Yeah. Um, well, as is, of course, very obvious, I didn't invent it, nor, nor did even Maggie Nelson. Um, I think that I mostly first came across it in European fiction, um, where it's, it's much more of a thought of as a way that you might um, organize something. But in terms of, I have a, occasionally when I go visit at a university, I've, I've had someone in the MFA department say, I really liked, you know, your book. Um, and I'm really mad that you wrote it because now all my students are imitating it. And right, exactly. It's much imitated. <laughs> and um, for me, it's about, uh, you know, I think visual artists are more open to this. But for me, it's about allowing for some element of chance um, yeah. in the arrangement of things, like not to be too schematic about it, not to be like making um, a point like, right. oh, this image will underscore that image. But I think the worst thing is that it can feel random. So I feel like um, I have to play around a lot with the organization of things. The farther I am into a novel, the less I do, but I have to constantly like see if something goes somewhere else. And when it does, it feels like there's a little click, but mostly I don't, the, the way I know that it works is I stop wanting to move it around. I'm like an endless editor. Of there are people that can write fragmentary novels really quickly. I'm just not one of them because I feel like, you know, there's that Buddhist idea, which is like, uh, you know, first thought, best thought. I feel like this does not apply to me. It's like yeah. thought, you know, Kind it's of okay thought. <laughs> it's interesting you're talking about it. You can't feel too pat, but you know, it can't feel too perfect and it can't feel too random. I mean, yeah. Um, okay, let's like I cut out things sometimes that seem too like yeah, because I don't know when I'm when I'm writing exactly where it's gonna end up. I'm I'm following the language and I'm often um, you know, I often start from uh just an emotional uh an emotional texture I want a book to have. So with Department of Speculation, I was thinking a lot about uh, loneliness and with weather, I was thinking a lot about dread. And then sometimes I have like uh, emotions I kind of want to mostly exclude. Mm. So like with, with Department, I wanted to, because you know she's a cheated on wife and I feel like we've seen this story so many times, I wanted to exclude self-pity. I yeah. wanted her to like feel as complicit really as anyone else in the story. Uh -huh. And then with weather, I wanted to exclude self-righteousness because I feel uh -huh. like once you, um, begin to care about these things, begin to, the temptation is to suddenly turn your gaze on everyone else and say, why aren't you doing just what I'm doing? Even though it might've taken right. you years and years and years to get to that point. Yeah, well, I guess before we before we start going to audience questions, um, I wanted to ask you about being, I guess you had said it in the, the Times profile and you were just talking about it earlier, being the person who can really take a dinner party, you know, from casual conversation to like, do you know all the birds are disappearing, you know, in like 20 seconds? And um, and I feel like I, you know, I I relate to that personally, you know, I feel like when you're always, when it's like on the tip of your tongue, when this sort of monstrous unsustainability of our lives and your choices and you know whatever is just like right there you know someone will say something about like a trigger word and i'll be like yeah you know like go and instantly take it so far um and i have not figured out how to modulate that so well and so i don't know you said you had gone through a couple of years of being that person at the dinner party what i what was how like how did that turn out <laughs> and um well and i guess the background to... oh go ahead yeah. well did you did is did you have to produce did like going straight to doom did people start coming to you for the as you put it the obligatory note of hope as well like did you feel the need to put a button on those conversations but like but wait there you know there's extinction rebellion you know there is yeah. there are people doing things mm -hmm. No, I don't think I felt the need to put a, a bit of hope on the end of it. I mean, I, I remember when I worked at a bookstore and I was always recommending books to this one guy who came in and then one, day, one time he came in and he said, could you just recommend one book that isn't so fucking depressing? I want to kill myself. And I was like, oh, 
know. Like, I don't know if I have that category. But, um, but I think with being the like doomer at the dinner party, it's slightly more complicated because, um, well, I'm from the South and um, I was very much not the doomer. I was very much the person that would um, make that dinner party be fine because I would be. And so when I started to feel that kind of weight, we're all like talking falsely and this other thing is going on. And when I, when I was deciding, um, there, there's this great line in a Joy Williams story where she says, it's a woman drunk at a party and she says she starts to feel like the conversation they're having that there's another conversation a subterranean conversation and she starts to the the drunk person starts to reference the subterranean conversation (laughs) so I felt like I was trying to do that I was like trying to be like yeah but aren't we afraid of of this too but then at a certain point I guess um because I was writing and because I was thinking these things through, one, the, the first thing was I actually became less like doom laden. Yeah. Um, and, and second of all, I think I had a place to put it. I didn't need necessarily to be the, um, you know, the ancient mariner <laughs> telling people <laughs> the story in the street. Yeah. That I also, I mean, when I find myself talking about something too much, I'm like, you need to just do this privately, you know, like, yeah, I, I'm just like, I, Oh, I just need to write. Like, yeah. I mean, I would talk the most when I was like not writing. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go. We've got 15 minutes. Let's talk. Uh, let's go to some of these audience questions. I was going to ask you this actually, but I was, you know, fearing that it was a selfish question. Heather asks, how has motherhood affected your writing? It's funny that I would think that's a selfish question. Um, well, I think that it was a big, um, I think it shaped my writing quite a bit um, because I was used to writing in a very, um, I almost want to call it like a bender way. Like I would write a lot and then not at all and then write a lot. And 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 before I had a, a kid, that was almost always because of work. Like I would work some crappy jobs or a bunch of crappy jobs. And then when I had enough money, um, I might quit and like write for a couple of weeks or something. Um, and, but once, once I had my daughter, um, I found that, you know, that was just not possible. Um, and, and so I started thinking about like using little scraps of time and what would it look like to do that? Um, and I also felt like all these years as a, as a professor, I'd been recommending these books that were, um, you know, written in fragments and it somehow not writing them myself. Um, and so I started to do it kind of as a, um, almost a desperate measure. Um, but it also felt like, oh, I wanted to write this way for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually before I started writing in the fragmentary style of department, I had written, um, a whole novel on similar themes from the point of view of actually the, the girl who has the affair versus the wife. And, um, and it just wasn't good. And when I stopped writing it, uh, I took it apart and kept a few little pieces and I, and I secretly wrote <laughs> poetry for a while. And I gave it to my friend who's a poet. And he, uh, he had this very wise system where I would just give him my poetry and he wouldn't read it. He would just hold on to it. Um, and, uh, and that's where the last line of uh, department comes from. It's like the only thing that's left of that uh, of that poetry, but something about, for me about stripping things down and trying to get closer to what feels like charged language, what feels like um, exciting to me in terms of the way narrative moves. Um, It was very freeing. I didn't know that anyone would like it though. I certainly did not think as I was writing it that more than a few, maybe other writer types would like it. I thought thought it was gonna be pretty, um, yeah, I I thought people were gonna find it too weird. Well, it's interesting, you know, you're, both of your last narrators are frustrated writers, right? And in department, um, the, or well, not Lizzie, like, you know, she feels more like a, she would have been a scholar, I think. Yeah. 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 But she, she feels the sort of un, you know, unmanifested potential Mm -hmm. and in department, the narrator is, you know, waiting on the spectacular second novel she hasn't published, but that was your spectacular second novel. And so, I mean, I guess like, what is your relationship to, you know, your, your second narrator is, 
Yeah, the, the like the relationship to, I guess, you know, the success of that book and the fact that, you know, people did fucking love it, you know? what? <laughs> well, I think that, I mean, in some ways, the Lizzie character is, is closer to me probably than, um, than the first character who I wanted to make a little sharper and a little um, more manic and a little more everything. Um, I guess I just know a lot of people who are incredibly smart people who, um, who I love to spend time with and who didn't end up doing the thing they thought they were gonna do. Um, and I feel like that's a really easy thing to have happen. Right. And we often only um, talk about it like it's um, a really sad thing or a tragic thing, but almost all the people I know are doing something they never expected to do and interested in it. Right. And so she really likes being a librarian and um, and I felt like that sort of um, process of coming to terms with what you have given the responsibilities of your life. Cause most of the people I know who didn't do something it's usually because it's usually because of like responsibilities they had to other people or money things. It's not usually because they just gave up. Right. Um, and so I wanted to sort of present that not as a tragedy but more right. as a like what happens if you take a different fork in the road. Right. Okay, a couple of people have asked questions about themes. I'm going to try to put them into one. So is people are asking sort of, do you start with a theme or a feeling or do you start with a character or a situation, you know, let's say for weather, which came first, Lizzie mm -hmm. or the, you know, or the, the milieu in which she is thinking? Mm -hmm. um, I think with weather, I wanted... I, I I would say the feeling came first and it was a feeling that was very much, I was just thinking about the phenomena, which I myself was experiencing of like anticipatory dread mm -hmm. when you're thinking of something, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was first writing it, it was actually just about getting older and feeling like, um, you, you know, doors were closing or people you loved were going to die. Um, it was, it was very, it was very morbid in that way. And then during that time I started for complicated reasons, reading about climate stuff. And I realized like how off my sense of it was, how much faster it was happening, how much worse it was than I'd understood. And then I started doing those calculations that people do who have kids where you, you know, you start realizing like, this isn't about great, great grandchildren, you know, yeah. this is what will happen um, to my own child. Right. And then I wanted to write uh, almost like a survival manual for her. Yeah. I kept thinking about how when she was older and things were so much worse, I wouldn't be able to help her because I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know anything about that life. And so part of it was this sort of strange, desperate attempt to become worthy of some kind of information I could give her. Um, and for a long time, I thought of it as an actual book that would have that inside it. But I, I later decided to um, sort of sprinkle it throughout. But um, but yeah, I was interested in that movement from like worrying about your own child to worrying about um, how it's going to affect other people in the world too. And that's sort of what her mentor, who is not a mother, um, is very harsh with her about yeah. like, do you think you can protect everyone? You think you can protect your child in such and such year, like then get really, really rich. You know, she just yeah. says it very harshly. Well, and then there's this one part. I mean, I, you know, like I, it's, when I was thinking about whether or not to, you know, even try to have a child, it was like, you know, to me, it seems sort of, I was like, this is like an, like an ethically monstrous decision to do in the climate crisis. Cause you know, this decision that I'm having, whether it's unethical to birth a child into a world, you know, is getting worse much quicker. I was like thinking about, you know, even if you do, what would that decision be like for this child? You know, it's going to be that it's going to be ex that decision will be exponentially worse for them and like the question of is caring still worth it anyway is like discovering the world still worth it anyway. All of that has been in my head for a lot for the last couple of years, but there's that part in, in weather where the mentor tells Lizzie, it's like, you know, well, it'll be better. I mean, obviously they can't have kids, you know? Yeah. And I was like, Ugh, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, but it's too late. Like she's already, you know, and of course no children, she says. And yeah, yeah. Like, oh my God. Right. Um, um, yeah. th th another part of this question that someone asked was, how do you stay interested in a topic and find new angles, you know, mm -hmm. over the course of 
you know, you were saying seven years, but I think you sort of answered that, right? It's like these ideas that you were thinking of, they loop into each other and they bring in, I mean, like yeah. you're talking about the whole span of. Right. And I mean, one thing I do sort of, I guess, actively is that um, when I'm learning about something, I, I kind of, I start reading about it in a way that would seem normal. Like say, if I was reading about um, climate crisis, I would read the science first or I would read whatever, but I sort of keep reading out from it. So pretty soon I started to read about like sociology, about why are people in denial about it? And then I started reading um, uh, like about experiments that they'd done in different parts. Then I started reading huge amounts of stuff about World War II and what did it mean um, when people half knew something um, or, 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 or they, well, when they, in the early years before people were sure that the Holocaust was going on, like oh, what kind right. of stories were they telling themselves? What were they? Uh -huh. um, and so I, you know, so I was reading all this stuff um, like that. And then um, I was reading, then I got into the survivalist thing. So part of the way I interest myself is just to continue to kind of um, see how thin a thread I can carry out through all these different disciplines. And I'm just, you know, I'm just super interested in reading um, outside of my own area. I always have liked that. So, um, you know, so somehow I end up reading about the Puritans and their ideas of, you know, dominion over the land. And it's like pretty far from my book, but I get the epigraph from it. And it's also, I mean, I, I have always loved that part of researching because, I mean, I loved it since I was in college because I was like, oh, you, this is work you can do while you're hungover. And it's even better because you're just sort of like dulled and the good stuff just jumps right out at you. That's what I feel like. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's the easiest part for me. Is the Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice. But it's also like... Um, you know, I, I still find it like what a privilege that I, you know, you can know nothing about like antelope vision, but then you, you know, like someone who's spent their whole life analyzing antelope eyeballs or whatever can tell you. I mean, it's like magic. Yeah. It is um, I guess we maybe have time for one more question. Um, the hour has passed so quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, Nessa asks, I found I need books more than ever to survive this moment. Um, but I'm vacillating between escapist novels and melancholy slash cautionary tales. Are there books that you find yourself returning to or gravitating towards these days? Um, well, I really enjoyed reading this book of essays by Natalia Ginsburg called The Little Virtues. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I found that that book was, um, I mean, it has a lot of sadness in it, but I also found it to be just uh, a really beautiful book to read right now. Um, when I, I taught class on um, on Wednesday, a Zoom class for my students, and they looked really um, frightened and kind of stunned after the election. And <clears throat> I said, maybe we're not going to talk about the story we're going to talk about today. Maybe I'm just going to read to you. And then I was trying to find something to read that was relaxing. And I actually read them um, Invisible Cities mm. by Calvino because there's, a, there's very few people in it. And so it, it has this weird way that it kind of washes over you. And so I just read to them for like 40 minutes from it. Um, and uh, it was an interesting experience because I was like, oh, this book is calming. Like I wouldn't have thought to pick it up, but, um, but and it's yeah. other worlds. That's really nice. Maybe I'll read. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm watching lots of escapist TV. My big thing now is watching like, basically any kind of show that's in another language so I can read it in subtitles, mm -hmm. but it can be totally cheese ball show. I'm like watching like Danish political drama and like Swedish, you know, drug pins. <laughs> Do you watch Alone on the History Channel? No. Oh my God. I feel like you, it's, you know, they, they drop, they drop 10 people into the middle of nowhere, you know, like deep in Arctic. Oh, I've seen ads for this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they self tape, which is so they're really actually alone, right? Unlike any of these other shows where they're like surviving, you know, they, they're truly, truly alone. And this late, the latest season of it, they, um, they'll get a million dollars if they can stay a hundred days in the Arctic and they only have 10 <laughs> items. It's, wow. it's pretty, it's pretty weather-ish. Like, I like that. I, I like it's that. really good. <laughs> um, I think we're at the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Jenny, for talking to me. It was such a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks you so much to the Charleston Literary Festival. It's been great to be on it. And um, thanks for pairing me with such a great interviewer. It's very, very fun. Um, okay, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, yay, go, go check your computer. Looks yeah, like I'll go check the vote counts. <laughs>